Ballad number thirty five of the Bab Ballads by W. S. Gilbert. Read for LibriVox.org by Graham Redman. Thompson Green and Harriet Hale. To be sung to the air of An Horrible Tale. O oh, list to this incredible tale of Thompson Green and Harriet Hale. It's truth in one remark you'll sum. Twaddle, 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 twum. O Thompson Green was an auctioneer, and made three hundred pounds a year, and Harriet Hale, most strange to say, gave pianoforte lessons at a sovereign a day. O Thompson Green, I may remark, met Harriet Hale in Regent's Park, where he, in a casual kind of way, spoke of the extraordinary beauty of the day. They met again, and, strange though true, he courted her for a month or two. Then to her pa, he said, says he, Old man, I love your daughter, and your daughter worships me. Their names were regularly banned, the wedding day was settled, and, I've ascertained by dint of search, they were married on the choir to St. Mary Abbot's Church. O oh, list to this incredible tale of Thompson Green and Harriet Hale, it's truth in one remark you'll sum. Twaddle, 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 twum. That very selfsame afternoon they started on their honeymoon, and, oh, astonishment, took flight to a pretty little cottage close to Shanklin, Isle of Wight. But now, you'll doubt my word, I know, in a month they both returned, and, lo, astounding fact, this happy pair took a gentlemanly residence in Canonbury Square. They led a weird and reckless life. They dined each day, this man and wife, pray disbelieve it if you please, on a joint of meat, a pudding, and a little bit of cheese. In time came those maternal joys which take the form of girls or boys, and, strange to say, of each that one, a tiddy-iddy daughter and a tiddy-iddy son. O oh, list to this incredible tale of Thompson Green and Harriet Hale! It's truth in one remark you'll sum. Twaddle, 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 twum. My name for truth is gone, I fear, but monstrous as it may appear, they let their drawing-room one day to an eligible person in the cotton-broking way. Whenever Thompson Green fell sick, his wife called in a doctor quick, from whom some words like these would come, Fiat missed some end of hostess in a cochlearium. For thirty years this curious pair hung out in Canonbury Square, and somehow wonderful to say, they loved each other dearly in a quiet sort of way. Well, Thompson Green fell ill and died, for just a year his widow cried, and then her heart she gave away to the eligible lodger in the cotton-broking way. O oh, list to this incredible tale of Thompson Green and Harriet Hale! It's truth in one remark you'll sum. Twaddle, 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 twum. End of ballad number 35 Thompson Green and Harriet Hale from the Bab Ballads. This recording is in the public domain. Number thirty six of the Bab Ballads by W. S. Gilbert. Read for LibriVox.org by Graham Redman. Bob Poulter. Bob Poulter was a navvy, and his hands were coarse and dirty too. His homely face was rough and tanned. His time of life was thirty two. He lived among a working clan a wife he hadn't got at all, a decent, steady, sober man, no saint, however, not at all. He smoked, but in a modest way, because he thought he needed it. He drank a pot of beer a day, and sometimes he exceeded it. At times he'd pass with other men a loud convivial night or two, with very likely now and then on Saturdays a fight or two, but still he was a sober soul, a labour-never-shirking man, who paid his way, upon the whole a decent English working man. 
One day, when at the Nelson's head, for which he may be blamed of you, a holy man appeared and said, Oh, Robert, I'm ashamed of you. He laid his hand on Robert's beer before he could drink up any, and on the floor with sigh and tear he poured the pot of threepenny. Oh, Robert, at this very bar a truth you'll be discovering. A good and evil genius are around your noddle hovering. They both are here to bid you shun the other one's society. For total abstinence is one, the other inebriety. He waved his hand, a vapour came, a wizard polter reckoned him. A bogey rose, and called his name, and with his finger beckoned him. The monster's salient points, to some, his heavy breath was portery, his glowing nose suggested rum, his eyes were gin and watery. His dress was torn, for dregs of ale and slops of gin had rusted it. His pimpled face was wan and pale, where filth had not encrusted it. "'Come, Poulter,' said the fiend, "'begin, and keep the bowl a-flowing on. A working man needs pints of gin to keep his clockwork going on.' Bob shuddered. "'Ah, oh, you've made a miss if you take me for one of you. "'You filthy beast, get out of this. "'Bob Poulter don't want none of you.' "'The demon gave a drunken shriek "'and crept away in stealthiness. "'And lo, instead, a person sleek "'who seemed to burst with healthiness. "'In me, as your adviser hints, "'of abstinence you've got a type.' Of Mr. Tweedy's pretty prince, I am the happy prototype. If you abjure the social toast and pipes and such frivolities, you possibly some day may boast my prepossessing qualities. Bob rubbed his eyes and made him blink. You almost make me tremble, you. If I abjure fermented drink, shall I indeed resemble you? And will my whiskers curl so tight, my cheeks grow smug and muttony, my face become so red and white, my coat so blue and buttony? Will trousers such as yours array extremities inferior? Will chubbiness assert its sway all over my exterior? In this my unenlightened state, to work in heavy boots I comes, Will pumps henceforward decorate my tiddle-toddle tootsicums? And shall I get so plump and fresh, and look no longer seedily? My skin will henceforth fit my flesh so tightly and so tweedily? The phantom said, You'll have all this, you'll know no kind of huffiness. Your life will be one chubby bliss, one long unruffled puffiness. "'Be off,' said irritated Bob. "'Why come you here to bother one? "'You pharisaical old snob! "'You're wuss almost than t'other one. "'I takes my pipe, I takes my pot, "'and drunk I'm never seen to be. "'I'm no teetotaler or sot, "'and as I am, I mean to be.'" End of ballad number 36, Bob Poulter from the Bab Ballads. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad number 37 of the Bab Ballads by W. S. Gilbert. Read for LibriVox.org by Graham Redman. The Story of Prince Agib Strike the concertina's melancholy string, Blow the spirit-stirring harp like anything. Let the piano's martial blast Rouse the echoes of the past, For of Agib, prince of Tartary, I sing. Of Agib, who amid Tartaric scenes Wrote a lot of ballet music in his teens, His gentle spirit rolls in the melody of souls, Which is pretty, but I don't know what it means. Of Agib, who could readily at sight Strum a march upon the loud theodolite, 
he would diligently play on the zoetrope all day, and blow the gay pantechnicon all night. One winter, I am shaky in my dates, came two starving Tartar minstrels to his gates. Oh, Allah be obeyed, how infernally they played! I remember that they called themselves the Waits. Oh, that day of sorrow, misery, and rage, I shall carry to the catacombs of age, photographically lined on the tablet of my mind, when a yesterday has faded from its page. Alas, Prince Agib went and asked them in, gave them beer and eggs and sweets and scent and tin, and when, as snobs would say, they had put it all away, he requested them to tune up and begin. Though its icy horror chill you to the core, I will tell you what I never told before. The consequences true of that awful interview, for I listened at the keyhole in the door. They played him a sonata, let me see, Medulla Oblongata, key of G. Then they began to sing that extremely lovely thing, Scherzando, ma non troppo, P. 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 He gave them money, more than they could count, sent from a most ingenious little fount, more beer in little kegs, many dozen hard-boiled eggs, and goodies to a fabulous amount. Now follows the dim horror of my tale, and I feel I'm growing gradually pale, for even at this day, though its sting has passed away, when I venture to remember it, I quail. The elder of the brothers gave a squeal, all overish it made me for to feel. O oh, prince, he says, says he, if a prince indeed you be, I've a mystery I'm going to reveal. O oh, listen, if you'd shun a horrid death, to what the gent who's speaking to you saith. No waits in truth are we, as you fancy that we be, for, to ramble, I am Alec, this is Beth. Said Agib, O oh, accursed of your kind, I have heard that ye are men of evil mind. Beth gave a dreadful shriek, but before he had time to speak, I was mercilessly collared from behind. In number ten or twelve, or even more, they fastened me full length upon the floor. On my face extended flat, I was walloped with a cat for listening at the keyhole of a door. Oh, the horror of that agonizing thrill! I can feel the place in frosty weather still. For a week from ten to four I was fastened to the floor while a mercenary whopped me with a will. They branded me and broke me on a wheel, and they left me in an hospital to heal. And upon my solemn word I have never, never heard what those Tartars had determined to reveal. But that day of sorrow, misery, and rage I shall carry to the catacombs of age, photographically lined on the tablet of my mind, when a yesterday has faded from its page. End of Ballad number 37 The Story of Prince Agib from the Bab Ballads This recording is in the public domain. Ballad number thirty eight of the Bab Ballads by W. S. Gilbert, read for LibriVox.org by Graham Redman. Ellen McJones, Aberdeen. Macpherson Clonglockety Angus MacLan was the son of an elderly labouring man. You've guessed him a Scotchman, shrewd reader, at sight, and perhaps altogether shrewd reader, you're right. From the bonny blue forth to the lovely dee side, round by Dingwall and Roth to the mouth of the Clyde, there wasn't a child or a woman or man who could pipe with Clonglockety Angus MacLan. No other could wake such detestable groans with reed and with chaunter, with bag and with drones. All day and all night he delighted the cheels with sniggering pebrocks and jiggerty reels. He'd clamber a mountain and squat on the ground, and the neighbouring maidens would gather around to list to the pipes and to gaze in his een, especially Ellen McJones Aberdeen. 
all loved their maclam save a sassenach brute who came to the highlands to fish and to shoot he dressed himself up in a highlander way though his name it was patterson corby torbay torbay had incurred a good deal of expense to make him a scotchman in every sense but this is a matter you'll readily own that isn't a question of tailors alone a sassenach chief may be bonily built he may purchase a sporran a bonnet and kilt stick a skein in his hose wear an acre of stripes but he cannot assume an affection for pipes clonglocketty's pipings all night and all day quite frenzied poor patterson corby torbay the girls were amused at his singular spleen especially ellen mcjones aberdeen macpherson clonglocketty angus my lad with pibrochs and reels you are driving me mad if you really must play on that cursed affair my goodness play something resembling an air boiled over the blood of macpherson maclan the clan of clonglocketty rose as one man for all were enraged at the insult i ween especially ellen mcjones aberdeen let's show said maclan to this sassenach loon that the bagpipes can play him a regular tune let's see said maclan as he thoughtfully sat in my cottage is easy i'll practice at that he blew at his cottage and blew with a will for a year seven months and a fortnight until you'll hardly believe it maclan i declare elicited something resembling an air it was wild it was fitful as wild as the breeze it wandered about into several keys it was jerky spasmodic and harsh i'm aware but still it distinctly suggested an air the sassenach screamed and the sassenach danced he shrieked in his agony bellowed and pranced and the maidens who gathered rejoiced at the scene especially ellen mcjones aberdeen hech gather hech gather hech gather around and fill all your lugs with the exquisite sound an air for the bagpipes beat that if you can hurrah for clonglocketty angus maclan the fame of his piping spread over the land respectable widows proposed for his hand and maidens came flocking to sit on the green especially ellen mcjones aberdeen one morning the fidgety sassenach swore he'd stand it no longer he drew his claymore and this was i think in extremely bad taste divided clonglocketty close to the waist oh loud were the wailings for angus maclan oh deep was the grief for that excellent man the maids stood aghast at the horrible scene especially ellen mcjones aberdeen it sorrowed poor patterson corby torbay to find them take on in this serious way he pitied the poor little fluttering birds and solaced their souls with the following words o oh, maidens said patterson touching his hat don't blubber my dears for a fellow like that observe i'm a very superior man a much better fellow than angus maclan they smiled when he winked and addressed them as dears and they all of them vowed as they dried up their tears a pleasanter gentleman never was seen especially ellen mcjones aberdeen End of ballad number 38 Ellen McJones Aberdeen from the Bab Ballads This recording is in the public domain Ballad number 39 of the Bab Ballads by W S Gilbert read for librivox.org by Graham Redman Peter the Wag policeman peter forth i drag from his obscure retreat he was a merry genial wag who loved a mad conceit if he were asked the time of day by country bumpkins green 
he not unfrequently would say a quarter past thirteen. If ever you, by word of mouth, inquired of Mr. Forth, the way to somewhere in the south, he always sent you north. With little boys his beat along, he loved to stop and play. He loved to send old ladies wrong, and teach their feet to stray. He would in frolic moments, when such mischief bent upon, take bishops up as betting men, bid ministers move on. Then all the worthy boys he knew he regularly licked, and always collared people who had had their pockets picked. He was not naturally bad or viciously inclined, but from his early youth he had a waggish turn of mind. The men of London grimly scowled, with indignation wild, the men of London gruffly growled, but Peter calmly smiled. Against this minion of the crown the swelling murmurs grew, from Camberwell to Kentish Town, from Rotherhithe to Kew. Still humoured he his wagsome turn, and fed in various ways the coward rage that dared to burn, but did not dare to blaze. Still retribution has her day, although her flight is slow. One day that crusher lost his way near Poland Street, Soho. The haughty boy, too proud to ask, to find his way resolved, and in the tangle of his task got more and more involved. The men of London, overjoyed, came there to jeer their foe, and flocking crowds completely cloyed the mazes of Soho. The news on telegraphic wires sped swiftly o'er the lee. Excursion trains from distant shires brought myriads to see. For weeks he trod his self-made beats through Newport, Gerard, Bear, Greek, Rupert, Frith, Dean, Poland streets, and into Golden Square. But all, alas, in vain, for when he tried to learn the way of little boys or grown-up men, they none of them would say. Their eyes would flash, their teeth would grind, their lips would tightly curl, they'd say, Thy way thyself must find, thou misdirecting churl. And similarly also when he tried a foreign friend, Italians answered, Il Balen, the French, no comprehend. The Russ would say with gleaming eye, Sevastopol, and groan. The Greek said, Tupto, Tuptomai, Tupto, Tuptine, Tuptone. To wander thus for many a year, the crusher never ceased. The men of London dropped a tear. Their anger was appeased. At length exploring gangs were sent to find poor Forth's remains. A handsome grant by Parliament was voted for their pains. To seek the poor policeman out, bold spirits volunteered, and when they swore they'd solve the doubt, the men of London cheered. And in a yard, dark, dank, and drear, they found him on the floor. It leads from Richmond Buildings, near the royalty stage door. With brandy cold and brandy hot, they plied him, starved and wet, and made him sergeant on the spot, the men of London's pet. End of ballad number 39, Peter the Wag, from the Bad Ballads. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad number 40 of the Bab Ballads by W. S. Gilbert Read for LibriVox.org by Graham Redman Ben Allah Ahmet, or The Fatal Tum I once did know a Turkish man whom I upon a two-pair back met. His name it was Effendi Khan Bakshish Pasha Ben Allah Ahmet. 
A Dr. Brown I also knew, I've often eaten of his bounty. The Turk and he, they lived at who in Sussex, that delightful county. I knew a nice young lady there. Her name was Emily Macpherson. And though she wore another's hair, she was an interesting person. The Turk adored the maid of who, although his harem would have shocked her. But Brown adored that maiden too. He was a most seductive doctor. They'd follow her where'er she'd go, a course of action most improper. She neither knew by sight, and so for neither of them cared a copper. Brown did not know that Turkish male. He might have been his sainted mother. The people in this simple tale are total strangers to each other. One day that Turk he sickened sore, and suffered agonies oppressive. He threw himself upon the floor, and rolled about in pain excessive. It made him moan, it made him groan, and almost wore him to a mummy. Why should I hesitate to own that pain was in his little tummy? At length a doctor came and rung, as Allah Ahmed had desired, who felt his pulse, looked up his tongue, and hemmed and hawed, and then inquired, Where is the pain that long has preyed upon you in so sad a way, sir? The Turk, he giggled, blushed, and said, I don't exactly like to say, sir. Come, nonsense, said good Dr. Brown. So this is Turkish coyness, is it? You must contrive to fight it down. Come, come, sir, please to be explicit. The Turk, he shyly bit his thumb, and coyly blushed like one half-witted. The pain is in my little tum, he whispering at length admitted. Then take you this, and take you that, your blood flows sluggish in its channel. You must get rid of all this fat, and wear my medicated flannel. You'll send for me when you're in need. My name is Brown, your life I've saved it. My rival, shrieked the invalid, and drew a mighty sword and waved it. This to thy weasened Christian pest! Aloud the Turk in frenzy yelled it, and drove right through the doctor's chest the sabre and the hand that held it. The blow was a decisive one, and Dr. Brown grew deadly pasty. Now see the mischief that you've done. You Turks are so extremely hasty. There are two Dr. Browns in who. He's short and stout, I'm tall and wizen. You've been and run the wrong one through. That's how the error has arisen. The accident was thus explained. Apologies were only heard now. At my mistake I'm really pained. I am indeed upon my word now. With me, sir, you shall be interred. A mausoleum grand awaits me. Oh, pray don't say another word. I'm sure that more than compensates me. But perhaps, kind Turk, you're full inside. There's room, said he, for any number. And so they laid them down and died. In proud Stamboul they sleep their slumber. End of ballad number 40 Ben Allah Ahmet or the Fatal Tum from the Bab Ballads. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad number 41 of the Bab Ballads by W. S. Gilbert, read for LibriVox.org by Graham Redman. The Three Kings of Chickaraboo There were three niggers of Chickaraboo, Pacifico, Bang Bang, Pop Chop, who exclaimed one terribly sultry day, Oh, let's be kings in a humble way. The first was a highly accomplished Bones, the next elicited banjo tones, the third was a quiet retiring chap who danced an excellent breakdown flap. We niggers, said they, have formed a plan by which whenever we like we can extemporize kingdoms near the beach, 
and then we'll collar a kingdom each. Three casks from somebody else's stores shall represent our island shores. Their sides the ocean wide shall lave, their heads just topping the briny wave. Great Britain's navy scours the sea, and everywhere her ships they be. She'll recognize our rank, perhaps, when she discovers we're royal chaps. If to her skirts you want to cling, it's quite sufficient that you're a king. She does not push inquiry far to learn what sort of king you are. A ship of several thousand tons, and mounting seventy-something guns, ploughed every year the ocean blue, discovering kings and countries new. The brave Rear Admiral Bailey Pip, commanding that magnificent ship, perceived one day his glasses through the kings that came from Chickaraboo. "'Dear eyes,' said Admiral Pip, "'I see three flourishing islands on our lee, and, bless me, most remarkable thing, on every island stands a king!' "'Come, lower the Admiral's gig,' he cried, "'and over the dancing waves I'll glide.' that low obeisance I may do to those three kings of Chickaraboo. The admiral pulled to the islands three, the kings saluted him graciously. The admiral, pleased at his welcome warm, unrolled a printed alliance form. "'Your Majesty, sign me this, I pray. I come in a friendly kind of way. I come, if you please, with the best intents, and Queen Victoria's compliments. The kings were pleased as they well could be, the most retiring of the three in a cellar flap to his joy gave vent, with a banjo-bones accompaniment. The great Rear Admiral Bailey Pip embarked on board his jolly big ship. Blue Peter flew from his lofty fore, and off he sailed to his native shore. Admiral Pip directly went to the lord at the head of the government, who made him, by a stroke of a quill, Baron de Pip of Piptonville. The College of Heralds' permission yield that he should quarter upon his shield three islands vert on a field of blue, with the pregnant motto Chickaraboo. Ambassadors, yes, and attaches too, are going to sail for Chickaraboo, and see, on the good ship's crowded deck, a bishop who's going out there on spec. And let us all hope that blissful things may come of alliance with darky kings, and may we never, whatever we do, declare a war with Chickaraboo. End of Ballad number 41 The Three Kings of Chickaraboo from the Bab Ballads this recording is in the public domain. Ballad number 42 of the Bab Ballads by W.S. Gilbert Read for LibriVox.org by Graham Redman Joe Go Lightly or The First Lord's Daughter a tar, but poorly prized, long, shambling, and unsightly, thrashed, bullied, and despised, was wretched Joe Golightly. He bore a workhouse brand, no pa or ma had claimed him, the beadle found him, and the board of guardians named him. Perhaps some princess's son, a beggar perhaps his mother, he rather thought the one, I rather think the other. He liked his ship at sea, he loved the salt sea water, he worshipped junk, and he adored the First Lord's daughter. The First Lord's daughter, proud, snubbed earls and viscounts nightly. She sneered at Bart's aloud, and spurned poor Joe Golightly. Whene'er he sailed afar, upon a channel cruise he unpacked his light guitar, and sang this ballad, Boozy. The moon is on the sea, willow, the wind blows towards the lee, willow, 
but though i sigh and sob and cry no lady jane for me willow she says twere folly quite willow for me to wed a white willow whose lot is cast before the mast and possibly she's right willow his skipper captain joyce he gave him many a rating and almost lost his voice from thus expostulating lay aft you lubber do what's come to that young man joe belay vast heaving you do kindly stop that banjo i wish i do oh law you'd shipped aboard a trader are you a sailor or a negro serenader but still the stricken lad aloft or on his pillow howled forth in accents sad his aggravating willow stern love of duty had been joyce's chiefest beauty says he i love that lad but duty damn me duty twelve months black hole i say where daylight never flashes and always twice a day a good six dozen lashes but joseph had a mate a sailor stout and lusty a man of low estate but singularly trusty says he cheer up young joe i'll tell you what i'm arter to that fuss lord i'll go and ax him for his darter to that fuss lord i'll go and say you love her dearly and joe said weeping low i wish you would sincerely that sailor to that lord went soon as he had landed and of his own accord an interview demanded says he with seaman's roll my captain what's a tartar gov joe twelve months black hole for lovering your darter he loves miss lady jane i own she is his betters but if you'll jine them twain they'll free him from his fetters and if so be as how you'll let her come aboard ship i'll take her with me now get out remarked his lordship that honest tar repaired to joe upon the billow and told him how he had fared joe only whispered willow and for that dreadful crime young sailors learn to shun it he's working out his time in six months he'll have done it. End of ballad number forty two Joe Go Lightly or the First Lord's Daughter from the Bab Ballads. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad number forty three of the Bab Ballads by W. S. Gilbert. Read for LibriVox.org by Graham Redman. To the Terrestrial Globe by a Miserable Wretch. Roll on, thou ball, roll on. Through pathless realms of space, roll on. What though I'm in a sorry case? What though I cannot meet my bills? What though I suffer toothache's ills? what though i swallow countless pills never you mind roll on roll on thou ball roll on through seas of inky air roll on it's true i've got no shirts to wear it's true my butcher's bill is due it's true my prospects all look blue but don't let that unsettle you never you mind roll on it rolls on end of ballad number forty three to the terrestrial globe by a miserable wretch from the bab ballads this recording is in the public domain Ballad number forty four of the Bab Ballads by W. S. Gilbert. Read for LibriVox.org by Graham Redman. Gentle Alice Brown. 
It was a robber's daughter, and her name was Alice Brown. Her father was the terror of a small Italian town. Her mother was a foolish, weak, but amiable old thing. But it isn't of her parents that I'm going for to sing. As Alice was a sitting at her window sill one day, a beautiful young gentleman he chanced to pass that way. She cast her eyes upon him, and he looked so good and true that she thought, I could be happy with a gentleman like you. And every morning past her house that cream of gentlemen, she knew she might expect him at a quarter unto ten. A sorter in the custom house, it was his daily road. The custom house was fifteen minutes' walk from her abode. But Alice was a pious girl who knew it wasn't wise to look at strange young sorters with expressive purple eyes. So she sought the village priest to whom her family confessed, the priest by whom their little sins were carefully assessed. O oh, holy father, Alice said, twould grieve you, would it not, to discover that I was a most disreputable lot? Of all unhappy sinners, I'm the most unhappy one. The padre said, Whatever have you been and gone and done? I have helped mamma to steal a little kiddie from its dad. I've assisted dear papa in cutting up a little lad. I've planned a little burglary and forged a little check, and slain a little baby for the coral on its neck. The worthy pastor heaved a sigh and dropped a silent tear, and said, You mustn't judge yourself too heavily, my dear. It's wrong to murder babies, little corals for to fleece, but sins like these one expiates at half a crown apiece. Girls will be girls, you're very young and flighty in your mind. Old heads upon young shoulders we must not expect to find. We mustn't be too hard upon these little girlish tricks. Let's see, five crimes at half a crown, exactly twelve and six. Oh, father, little Alice cried, your kindness makes me weep. You do these little things for me so singularly cheap. Your thoughtful liberality I never can forget. But, oh, there is another crime I haven't mentioned yet. A pleasant-looking gentleman with pretty purple eyes I've noticed at my window as I've sat a-catching flies. He passes by it every day, as certain as can be. I blush to say I've winked at him, and he has winked at me. "'For shame!' said Father Paul. "'My erring daughter, on my word, this is the most distressing news that I have ever heard.' Why, naughty girl, your excellent papa has pledged your hand to a promising young robber, the lieutenant of his band. This dreadful piece of news will pain your worthy parents so. They are the most remunerative customers I know. For many, many years they've kept starvation from my doors. I never knew so criminal a family as yours." The common country folk in this insipid neighbourhood have nothing to confess, they're so ridiculously good. And if you marry any one respectable at all, why, you'll reform, and what will then become of Father Paul? The worthy priest he up and drew his cowl upon his crown, and started off in haste to tell the news to Robber Brown, to tell him how his daughter, who was now for marriage fit, had winked upon a sorter who reciprocated it. Good Robber Brown, he muffled up his anger pretty well. He said, I have a notion, and that notion I will tell. I will nab this gay young sorter, terrify him into fits, and get my gentle wife to chop him into little bits. I've studied human nature, and I know a thing or two. Though a girl may fondly love a living gent, as many do, a feeling of disgust upon her senses there will fall when she looks upon his body chopped particularly small. 
He traced that gallant sorter to a still suburban square. He watched his opportunity and seized him unaware. He took a life preserver and he hit him on the head, and Mrs. Brown dissected him before she went to bed. And pretty little Alice grew more settled in her mind. She never more was guilty of a weakness of the kind, until at length good robber Brown bestowed her pretty hand on the promising young robber, the lieutenant of his band. End of ballad number forty four, Gentle Alice Brown, and of the Bab Ballads. This recording is in the public domain.